The field of viral therapy for cancer actually dates back um, uh, even to the beginning of the 20th century where there were um, anecdotal case reports of uh, kids, for example, who had lymphoma, contracted measles, and then um, had spontaneous remission of their cancers. So, uh, you know, there were actually trials of uh, viral therapy uh, using attenuated wild-type viruses injected into patients' tumors throughout the 1940s you know, and 50s. Um, unfortunately, it was a race. Uh, the, you know, the, we now know that um, the tumor environment is very immunosuppressive and is a very permissive you know, location for viruses to replicate in. Um, but with these oncolytic viruses, as they were called, um, it becomes a race between the virus destroying the immune privileged, you know, the immunosuppressive environment that's protecting them from the immune system um, and killing the tumor uh, versus the, uh, the immune system coming in to kill the virus. So then, you know, in the end, often the virus lost, the tumor would recur, and it was a therapeutic disappointment. So um, uh, with the advent of modern chemotherapy, radiation therapy in the 1950s and 60s, um, viral therapy just kind of disappeared off the map. So then uh, fast forward and now in the gene therapy field we use viruses as gene delivery vectors but uh, replication defective vectors are you know not efficient enough to, uh, to uh, in terms of delivering enough uh, the genes to enough cancer cells and so uh, a lot of the field has moved back to using replicating viruses. Now we still face the same problem that the antiviral immune response kind of tends to try to kill the virus before the virus can, can kill the tumor. So we decided to use a completely different virus, which is a non-cytolytic virus. It doesn't kill its host. It's not a, um, you know, uh, pillage, destroy, move on kind of virus. It actually is a benign parasite that deposits its genome, uh, reverse transcribes its RNA into DNA, and then integrates permanently into the chromosomes of the host cell. So it becomes a part of the cancer cell genome, and the cancer cell can't get rid of it. And so it's a very persistent, stealthy virus that buds off, um, cloaking itself in the plasma membrane of the host cell as it spreads through the tumor. And so it's relatively low immunogenicity. Um, and we can, even though it doesn't naturally kill cells as it spreads, uh, we can uh, arm it with a uh, suicide gene, which is actually uh, encodes a prodrug converting enzyme, which takes, uh, which basically now deposits this gene throughout the tumor. Um, it's like a time bomb, and basically uh, the, now the tumor cells are all primed uh, to make this enzyme, which will take a, a non-toxic pill, which, you know, with a, which is a prodrug, uh, which has no you know, adverse effects systemically, but then right inside the tumor will get converted into an active anti-cancer drug. So, um, so then, you know, you don't get the systemic, because you're forcing the tumor to create its own, manufacture its own chemotherapy locally within itself, uh, you don't get the systemic side effects and your immune system remains intact. And we've shown that you actually get anti-tumor immunity uh, being activated once you kill off enough tumor cells. We're, we're giving cancer a, a, a parasite that it can't get rid of that um, replicates selectively in the tumor and nowhere else and uh, forces, yeah, forces the tumor cell to, to, to destroy itself. So there are several, actually, there are um, multiple mechanisms at play. And the, the first thing is that this is a simple virus that has no nuclear localizing signal. So it, it is incapable of traversing an intact nuclear membrane uh, in quiescent cells. And most of our cells and tissues are quiescent. Um, and so it needs to wait until a cell is actively dividing, the nuclear membrane dissolves during mitosis, and only then can it access the chromosomes, integrate itself, and fulfill its life cycle. So that's one mechanism of selectivity. Um, but uh, perhaps an even more important mechanism of selectivity is that um, we now know that um, uh, tumors, cancer cells evolve to have defects in innate immunity. Um, interferon signaling pathways are mutated because when those, those pathways are activated, you do things like stop cell cycle, you know, arrest protein synthesis, things that tumors don't like. So tumors often evolve with um, defects in their interferon signaling pathways, which makes it a very um, permissive environment for these viruses and provides that tumor selectivity. We were fortunate to um, meet you know, kind of um, with um, uh, biotech partners and uh, a company called Tokogen, 
uh, which and uh, disclosure here, I'm a consultant for Tokigen, but um, they licensed our technology. Um, they were initiated in late 2007, and since then, they have um, uh, conducted three early phase clinical trials, uh, phase one dose escalation trials, uh, delivering the virus in three different ways. One is a direct injection through a, a biopsy needle. Um, another is a resection followed by injection around the tumor cavity margin. And the third is now an IV trial where it's delivered you know, systemically uh, and still, you know, latches hold through the leaky my, um, neovasculature uh, into the tumor microenvironment and then spread selectively. Um, and um, those trials uh, are all in recurrent um, high-grade glioma patients with, you know, brain cancer, terminal brain cancer. They've failed all other surgery, chemotherapy, radiation. Uh, and um, those trial results have been quite promising so far. Um, historically, um, our benchmark, the benchmarks for this disease are about seven to eight months of prognosis. So once you've uh, had a brain cancer, you know, a, a high-grade brain cancer, um, and it has recurred and has failed prior therapy, you have about a seven to eight-month survival um, on average. So um, in our early phase trials so far, we've seen um, the median overall survival is about um, uh, 14 months. So, um, and this is in, uh, we've treated over 128 patients now uh, in these three clinical trials. Uh, so this, we feel it's extremely promising. Um, by contrast, the latest uh, chemotherapy drugs that were approved for, you know, glioblastoma, um, uh, Avastin basically doesn't affect, uh, doesn't improve median overall survival. It improves quality of life. Um, temozolomide, which is the mainstay of therapy for glioblastoma, um, was approved on the basis of phase three trials, which uh, showed a six-week survival benefit. So we're actually doing better than six months of survival benefits. So um, I think, uh, and that's averaged over all dose cohorts. We see a dose response where the higher dose cohorts, which were initiated later, actually show you know, longer, you know, better results, and we're following those up now. But uh, we've now, uh, based on those promising results from the early phase trials, uh, late last year we've initiated a um, uh, phase 2B3 uh, trial um, for seeking registration. So this is uh, now initiated in over 20 clinical sites in the U.S. and Canada. Um, we're aiming to initiate 70 sites uh, worldwide by the end of the year. And um, uh, hopefully, uh, because our benchmark is eight months of median survival um, with current therapies, uh, in, with this randomized trial uh, versus current therapies, uh, we hope that within a year we'll be able to get approval uh, for our therapy. Yes, um, that's a very good point. I think, you know, um, what we would like is to further kind of, you know, um, understand the you know, how to optimize the therapy. And I think um, one, of the th one of the striking things, however, is, you know, the median survival is, is, you know, 14 months or so versus seven or eight months with standard therapy. But that's the median. And if you look at the survival curve, you actually see a plateau. Um, so 20 or 30 percent of patients across all, you know, when you average all dose cohorts, and it's actually better, more like 40 percent with the higher dose cohorts, but um, overall 20 or 30 percent of patients, you know, are, are um, surviving past the two-year mark. So our two-year survival rate is, is over 20 percent. Um, and this is a disease where you really almost never see a reported two-year survival rate. Um, so we, we think those patients are showing long-term you know, durable remissions, uh, and we are hoping uh, to improve that um, uh, plateau. It's very similar to what you see with checkpoint inhibitors. So we think that's an uh, uh, indication that we are activating anti-tumor immunity, which is allowing long-term survival of these patients. And what we'd like to do is take that plateau and make it higher and uh, increase the uh, long-term survival uh, of um, a larger and larger percentage of patients. Well, um, we are um, initiating this large phase two um, uh, slash three clinical trial. Um, this will re require 170 patients um, at, at multiple trial sites throughout the U.S., Canada, uh, and various other countries that we're, we're hoping to initiate in. And, um, but this is a, a, a large effort. 
Um, and so we would really um, like to, um, I think this, you know, kind of um, through these interviews and through kind of um, working with patient groups, we would like to try to maximize enrollment uh, in these trials because we think it's a very promising therapy and we think it'll help patients. And uh, we're hoping that patients will, will enroll in our trial and uh, help with that effort.